Good afternoon. Welcome to the 70th edition of the Winter Show, a benefit for Eastside House. We're thrilled to have you all with us today for our uh, discussion on Murano Glass, America, and the history of the world. We're thrilled to have two of our fabulous exhibitors uh, participating in this panel. Uh, Sarah Bloomberg of Glass Past will be moderating uh, with Jim Oliveira, who is also author of the lecture title, Murano Glass, America and the History of the World. We're also delighted to be able to welcome Jonathan Stewart Gordon, the Curator of American Decorative Arts at the Yale University Art Gallery, and Giorgio Spanu, co-founder of Magazzino Italian Art Foundation. So without further ado, I'd like to turn it over to all of you. Thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you so much, Helen. And thank you all for being here with us. We're very happy to be joined, uh, as Helen mentioned, by John Stuart Gordon from Yale and Giorgio Spanu from Magazzino. Uh, obviously, we share a great passion for glass, as I'm assuming many of you do. And I am uh, very happy to see you all. And I want to tell you a little bit about what we will speak about today and a little bit more about the book itself, Murano Glass, America and the History of the World. But first, I'm going to tell you just a little bit, I think a lot of you know, but Jim and I have been uh, private dealers in the field of Italian glass for over 30 years. And uh, we look really at glass from a 100-year period, 1870 to 1970. And of course, that's a very long period and a very rich one, and we'll speak more about that. Uh, but it's uh, really thrilling for us to be able to talk about uh, glass on, on such a wide level. So uh, Jim's book, is really about uh, the connection between Murano glass, the glass made on the island of Murano, and America. And there are some unbelievable connections there that many of you might not be aware of. I certainly wasn't. And I'm going to ask Jim to speak more about the book. But to get started, and this is the only time I will read to you, I promise, I'm just going to read a little synopsis of the book so you know what you're getting into, so to speak. Uh, Murano Glass, America and the History of the World. This richly illustrated book offers a sprawling exploration of the history of glass and the relationship between America and the artistic glass made on the island of Murano in the 19th and 20th century. The story includes dynamic but little known historical figures from around the globe whose obsessive desires drove the production and presentation of Venetian glass forever changing its impact on the world at large. Issuing the usual format of historical narratives, as the amusing title suggests, Murano Glass, America, and the History of the World examines the tradition of glassmaking as a bellwether of civilization. Jim takes us from the ancient world to the formative years of glass production and design in the 20th century. The connection between Venice and America is established through twists and turns and includes a cast of highly unusual characters, foremost among them, James Jackson Jarvis, 1818 to 1888, who was the son of the founder of Sandwich Glass in America. Jarvis' life as an exuberant expat, art historian, and insatiable collector of Italian art and design is at the heart of this dynamic tale. So I will be getting to Jim in one second, but I do want to say that I think we represent really a very interesting group altogether because we cover all bases. We have, uh, Jim and I obviously are dealers. Uh, John Stuart Gordon is, of course, uh, coming to this uh, from an academic standpoint and is the author, by the way, of a wonderful book called American Glass, which Jim and John will talk more about. And Giorgio Spagno is really one of the foremost collectors, along with his wife, Nancy Olnick, of Murano Glass in the world. And we're going to discuss not only their collection at large, but a wonderful exhibition that has just opened at their museum, which is devoted to the glass of Carlos Scarpa. So to get started, even though I, of course, know the answers to these questions, as the in-house editor, sort of. Um, I want Jim to tell us a little bit about why he decided, how he decided to write this book. Jim. Okay, thank you, Sarah. I was, I was hoping you'd ask me that question. Um, I, uh, the title, Murano Glass, America and the History of the World, it, it's sort of a Monty Python-esque title, and I, I like that. Um, but it's actually quite descript, because in the book, I really talk about the history of Murano Glass, but also how, as Sarah said, how Americans were involved in the history, and then also how all of these stories are part of a larger arc of history. So I'm taking, I'm not just doing the history of Murano Glass, but bringing it into a larger context. And the reason I decided to write the book in this way is because, as Sarah said, we've been specialists in Italian glass for about 30 years. 
Um, and about 10 years ago, people started saying to us, hey, you know, you guys have been at this for a long time, you know the material, you should write a book. So we thought about it and talked about it a lot. And, you know, I thought, well, what can I add? All my colleagues have, you know, my European colleagues have written excellent books. They've done the heavy lifting. They've done the beautiful art books that talk about all the companies, the makers, the techniques. And we're very familiar with the books and we know all the authors, Marina Barovier, Franco de Boni, um, so many others, Rosa Barovier Mentasti. So I thought, you know, what can we add? But as we discussed it and I thought about it, one of the things that I realized is that Sarah and I saw the glass as outsiders from a different perspective. Um, we're from downtown New York. We worked in galleries in the 80s. We both studied art history and we're Americans. So we, we, have, we look at the glass through a different cultural lens. So that was one thing. And then another thing that happened was I realized that Sarah and I had learned lots of stories about people like us. Americans, Brits, people from outside the world of Murano Glass who actually affected the history and were very deeply involved. And some of those people had fascinating stories. And so I thought, okay, there's, there's really a book here. There's something for me to work with. So I started to do research and put it together. And so I ended up coming up with this structure of the first um, chapter is called 5,000 Years of Glass History in 10 Pages or Less. So it's another Python-ish thing, but it's, again, it's, I, I do it in 10 pages or less, and it kind of establishes the tone. Um, I bring in influences from all over the place. I talk about creation myths, uh, and I bring in little-known facts, and I try to make it fun because I love history, and I think it's important, and I, I want to convey that. Um, then after that, I talk about... Uh, the history of the Venetian Republic, which I thought I knew something about until I really started to, to do research. And I didn't even realize that it was an independent republic from the year 697 until 1797. And the history is so rich and fantastic. And I go on and on in my book about it. But the first chapters, I kind of establish a tone. And you get the idea of what I'm going to do. I'm setting the stage. But the real action of the book starts when I get into the 19th century, because another fact that's overlooked sometimes is during the 19th century, Venice was under occupation. Napoleon sailed into the harbor in 1797, conquered Venice, um, and then the dreaded Austrians, their enemies, took over, uh, and they had an occupying force there, kind of trashing the city and really putting the screws to Venetian culture, and it was a dark time for Venice. And Murano Glass was almost lost because uh, the Austrians tried to crush the business. They had the Bohemian market, and they really almost destroyed Murano Glass. But the enterprising Veneziani, they got together, they waited till the Austrians were almost out, and they reestablished the glass industry. So that's where my cast of characters really enter the stage, starting with Dr. Antonio Salviati, who re brings the industry back, and he puts together an all-star cast of all the greatest blowers from the oldest families, because remember, since 1291, they were blowing glass on the island of Murano. And so that's the rebirth. And that's when the first American that I talk about really enters the scene, James Jackson Jarvis, who, as Sarah mentioned, his father was Deming Jarvis, the founder of Boston and Sandwich Glass Company. And he, was a, he had an unbelievably epic life. And there he is, by the way. That's there, James there's Jackson a, Jarvis reading. There's a great... Oh, hi. Oh, there he is, reading, yes. Um, he had an incredibly dynamic life, and there's a great biography written by Francis Stiegmuller in the early 50s about Jarvis. It's called The Two Lives of James Jackson Jarvis. As a young man, he went and lived in Hawaii and was the editor of the first newspaper west of the Rockies. He got in all kinds of adventure and trouble uh, because he was an obsessive collector. Um, while he was there, he got involved with the politics of Hawaii. He wrote the first great book about the history of Hawaii, which is still used today. Um, but he was terrible at business. Uh, he blew all his money. He got in a lot of trouble. He and his wife were bohemians. They were always fighting. Uh, it's a really interesting story. But anyway, he became a famous American expat, and he first moved to... He brought his family eventually to London, then Paris, where he, in the Louvre, he fell in love with painting and especially with the Italian primitives. And at the time, in the 1850s, late 1850s, early 1860s, nobody was interested in the Italian primitives, in the pre-Raphaelites. And the Louvre had them, right? Because the Italians well, didn't want them this is the thing. Back, you know, right? the yeah. Louvre is where Napoleon stashed all his loot. And then after Waterloo, they had to give it back. 
However, the Italians didn't want the Pre-Raphaelite paintings back <laughs> because they, at the time, you know, it was the, the attitude in the 19th century was they wanted Renaissance paintings. They wanted humanism. They didn't want to see Cimabue. They didn't want to see flattened perspectives and gold. They wanted the Renaissance. So, but Jarvie saw these paintings and lost his mind. He became obsessed with them. And so he moved his family. They moved from Paris to Florence. And that's the thing. In the 1850s and 60s, if you were a freewheeling bohemian, you didn't necessarily go to Paris. You went to Florence. Everyone was there. He was hanging out with the Brownings. That's where he became really great friends with John Ruskin. And so Jarvis was a maverick, and he spent a fortune and went completely broke buying pre-Raphaelite paintings. Uh, and it's a great story, but bringing it back to Italian glass, how does it relate? Well, he's the most important figure. He's the, kind of the central figure of my book because he started a collection of Murano glass. In the 1860s, when Salviati was just getting the business going with some great people in Venice, he went, he met them, and he started to collect, with their advice, he started to collect Italian glass. He was the first American to put together a comprehensive collection. And so his collection ranges from the 13th century to the 19th century. Uh, so he built this collection of 300 pieces. He eventually, in the 1880s, gave it to the new museum, the Metropolitan Museum of Art, where it still exists. It's called the Jarvis Gift. Some of it's on view, not all of it. Not right. all. Some of it is on view. It was very misunderstood. Um, and he, again, hijinks followed Jarvis everywhere he went. And it's a very amazing story. Uh, he's also very connected to Yale. Um, and John's going to talk a little bit about that. Uh, so that's my segue into right, Exactly. And Jarvis. John actually provided yet another image of Jarvis for us, which is from, of course, the collection at Yale. So I'd love it, John, if you could talk a little bit about, I mean, I know that there's a lot to talk about. And yeah, with, uh, with Jarvis, there's a ton to talk about. Um, and it's going to seem like a salacious story, and we've already gotten a little salacious um, but you know, art history is essentially gossip with footnotes, so um, it's it's going to be good. You know, so he's building this collection. Um, as Jim mentions, he's a terrible businessman, so he's completely broke all the time. He starts shopping it around in 1860, and it goes on view in New York at the New York Historical Society. The great um, taste arbiter Clarence Cook. Um, falls in love with this collection and starts saying, you know, New York needs to band together and buy this collection and maybe it should be the, the centerpiece of a museum for our metropolis. And it falls on deaf ears. Um, people are not interested in this. Um, he takes it up to Boston where it's put at the, um, the Athenaeum in Boston and the great um, critic Charles Eliot Norton does the same thing in Boston and says this needs to be the centerpiece of a museum for the, uh, for the city of Boston. No one bites. Um, what's fascinating though is these two campaigns, Clarence Cook in, in New York and Charles Eliot Norton in Boston, they don't succeed in getting Jarvis's collection, but those campaigns are what establish the Metropolitan Museum of Art and the MFA Boston. So although neither of them got the art, he's at the center of these cities realizing that they should be doing something for art um, in, in their region. Um, but that doesn't help his financial issues. He's still broke. And um, but also one of these tensions, which I love, is the reason why no one was rallying behind Clarence Cook or, uh, or, or Charles Eliot Norton is because these were all Italian primitives. And if you look at the founding directors of um, the MFA Boston and the Metropolitan Museum of Art, it's John Frederick Kensett, it's, uh, you know, it's contemporary artists. So he was losing the battle because no one was interested in old art, people were only interested in contemporary art, circa 1860. So no story is new. Um, we're still battling th that, that tension today. Absolutely. And he, but he, he needs the money. So he goes to the one place that does have a museum and people th believe it has deep pockets, he goes to Yale. And, he's, and Yale has just opened a new museum building in 1867 and he says, will the university lend me some money and I'll give you my paintings as collateral. 
So in 1867, he sends his entire collection to New Haven, um, and, New Haven and Yale cuts him a check for uh, $20,000, $22,000, which was a fortune. Yale didn't have that kind of money. Um, there are great notes in our archives about how pissed off the, the board was that um, the art school was able to get was able to do this um, this one upsmanship, and it he had to pay back the money in three years. So three years passes, the check has not arrived, the paintings are still on the wall of the museum, and Yale says, "Sorry, um, it's time." They managed to drag it out to um, 1871 when Yale says, okay, we really need our, our money. Um, we are going to stage an auction of your collection. And because that was the terms of the, of, of the loan. And the, the idea was that he would raise enough money to pay back Yale. And then he starts seeing dollar signs and he thinks, oh, actually, we're going to sell this piece by piece and individually these things are going to make a great, you know, I'm gonna be so rich from this auction. Perfect. Unfortunately, that was never the terms of the Jarvis collection. When he was selling it around New York, it was always a unit. When he was selling it around Boston, it was a unit. And Yale, are, they're not idiots, they said, we are going to keep it as a unit. So you, we will hold an auction, um, and, but you can only have one lot, your collection. And Oh, a few other stipulations. You can't hold the sale in New York or Boston. You are holding it in New Haven. And Jarvis is nonplussed, um, but what can he do? So, on, uh, and I'm gonna make, I'm, I'm, uh, this is just hearsay. I, I, I assume it's a rainy day. On a rainy day in New Haven, um, the auction starts in the museum building. There are no bidders, because no one wants to go to New Haven. Um, the, Pizza wasn't good yet. And um, the only bidder is Yale University for $22,000. And may I interrupt you for one minute? Yes. It's, that's great. <laughs> it's really amazing to hear this from the perspective of Yale. Because um, we always come off well in this story. <laughs> <laughs> well, you guys come out ahead, so there you go. Uh, one thing I will say is they, from what I know, Yale didn't announce that it was going to be a single uh, one lot until the day or two before. Correct. So bidders were yeah, led I did, to I didn't believe say we fair. Jarvis wasn't <laughs> happy about so, splitting up the collection. He always wanted it to go to one institution or one collector in the United States. Because remember, he was part of the generation who started the concept of museums in the United States. It's, it's hard to imagine now, but until that time, there really weren't pub very many public there weren't very many public institutions. So anyway, from the Jarvis perspective, it's a little bit different. But at, so at the last minute, Yale announced this, which could be seen as a legalistic trick. And the, the collectors, the collectors, you, you said gossip, there it is. So the collectors who were planning on bidding on individual pieces were just shut out. They said, forget it, no one wants to buy the whole collection. And so Yale sort of engineered this bit I'll also say that the money that they gave Jarvis, he spent it all. <laughs> he, he bought a beautiful William Blake and, and a lot of other things, but he, he couldn't help himself. And so that's how this story went down. So now I also Yale... think this is why the, the Salviati glass does not come to Yale. I mean, he is... He, um, it was a relationship that did not end well. And um, you know, he, he, he did... He settled his debts, but then he proceeded just to badmouth the university left and right. Um, and so I, but, and I do think it's actually rather nice that when the glass came up, it ended up going to the Met because that was the museum that really kind of emerges out of trying to sell his collection the first time round. So it, it, New Haven never had a shot at that, but um, <laughs> yeah. We had burned that bridge, but we have lovely early Italian art, and actually it is still one of the most important collections of early Italian art outside of Italy. Um, and with a lot of unusual things, I, I, I put this up because it's a brand name, but um, really spectacular. And if you love a gold ground painting, come to New Haven. Um, it's, it's, it's really the gift that, it's the gift that keeps on giving. Yeah, I mean, museums are collections of collectors. So, um, so Jarvis is just one story. For, for my department, which is American Decorative Arts, the person is Francis Garvin. 
And we have, a, we have a picture of him somewhere. It's a great, great picture. And you just, now you've just seen all the images. There we go. There's, there's Garvin. When he decided to get his, his portrait painted, I love the fact that his, he's in his office, um, and that is a Boston two-handled covered cup by Edward Winslow on the mantle behind him. And silver after his wife was his first love. And, but I also love peeking out of there um, is a, a Pennsylvania um, 18th century sugar bowl, glass sugar bowl. So you get the sense of the man and his collections and what he's interested in. Um, he goes to, he's first generation Irish Catholic, grows up in West Hartford and goes to Yale. Um, it catapults him to a completely different social world. Um, this is a crowd where if I say, who knows who Evelyn Nesbitt is? Thank you. Love talking in New York. Um, so the woman on the red velvet swing who becomes the centerpiece of the great um, Stanford White murder trial. Um, that was Francis Garvin's first case after graduating law school. So um, this young guy from um, you know, West Hartford comes into New York society. Um, Suddenly, he and his clients are splashed over the pages of every paper. Um, he marries um, a woman named Mabel Brady. Her father laid the electrical grid for uh, northern New York. Uh, he, um, her father and J.P. Morgan died within a few weeks of each other, and the estates were roughly equivalent. Um, it's, so you get a sense. He married into a lot of wealth, and they used it spectacularly. They became collectors, they started collecting British material, and then they bought a few fakes, and they felt so burned by that that they decided to only focus on American material because they felt there were no fakes in American furniture. <laughs> um, and they started hoovering up every object they could possibly could, but he worked with advisors, and for his glass, he worked with a woman named Rhea Niddle who really was the first, um, one of the first great glass scholars. Edwin Atlee Barber, who is in Philadelphia, writes the first history of American glass in 1900. Rhea Niddle writes the second one in 1927. Um, she's an overlooked figure these days. I think she deserves a huge amount of credit for creating the glass field in the early 20th Her century. Her writing is great, by the way. It's the best book on the subject, maybe to, the, to this day, until your book, of course. Yeah. No, that's, that, that's true. She's, she's really good. <laughs> um, and I actually was thrilled to kind of resurrect her, her story. Um, she was based in Ohio. And um, so this is Ohio. This is the kind of stuff she became known for. This piece was actually illustrated in her 1927 book. Francis Garvin taps her and says, I need an advisor. Um, so she goes back to all the people who lent her illustrations for her book and says, now we want to buy them. Um, and or she, she said, oh, if you have a sugar bowl like that, um, let's find it. So she recreates her book for Garvin and then starts um, looking very broadly. Um, I brought this because this is uh, Boston and Sandwich. So this is Jarvis's father's firm. So Deming Jarvis does the Boston and Sandwich Glass Company. Um, and they become so well known for elaborate lacy pressed glass. Um, Garvin and many of his colleagues hated this material. Um, even in the 20s and 30s, it was despised. It was fussy. It was Victorian. Um, and, but Niddle realized that this was actually genius. And what um, Deming Jarvis and his company did was to really perfect a new way of pressing glass. Um, if something like this, this compote that does seem so old-fashioned to our modernist sensibilities, um, it is you know, using a hydraulic press to get that really sharp delineation in the mold. Um, it is um, uranium glass, uh, which is something that Jarvis um, gets from a glass house um, in Scotland. And, you know, it is the cutting edge of technology. Um, this is kind of, you know, the iPhone of glass um, in, in the 1820s and 30s. And so, um, so Rhea realizes this and forces Garvin to buy a whole collection of pressed glass, um, which he loves. But then there are also objects like this. And this is what Garvin and many of his colleagues thought was good glass. It was honest. It was forthright. Um, you get a sense of this really being made by a glass blower. 
Um, this is, I love the austerity of this. This is also from Ohio. And I love that you have collectors in the 20s and 30s going after material like this, thinking that they are part of a colonial revival mentality, thinking they're thinking about history, they're thinking about the past. Yes. Yes, they're looking at this as authentic. And people like Lewis Mumford, um, the great kind of polemicist um, writer, is talking about how we as a culture need to go back to the colonial period. Um, industrialization brought so many social and financial ills. Let's go back to a more authentic time. I mean, I don't think any of us really want to go back to the colonial period, but this was the imagination. At the exact same time, modernism is banging on the door of historicism. I could change the title on this and say that this is, I don't know, Russell Wright, Scarpa. I mean, the, the idea it's, that it's, it's minimalism, really. It's, you, it's these Euclidean forms, the perfect circle, the, the restraint. So I, there's this whole world of objects that these people who are in the colonial past are seeing as honest, and the people who are modern are seeing as honest. And it, it all kind of overlaps together. And I think, I, I find moments like this so kind of exhilarating. Absolutely, I, it's, it's very interesting. And um, also, because of industrialization, people were looking for things that were hand blown, where you could see the hand of the craftsman, where you know these old traditions, people realized that these traditions were dying out and they were being replaced by mechanization. And in Venice, that was a big part of the whole appeal of Venice. It was the Byzantine world that you could revisit, and we still have that feeling today. Uh, it was a place that was beyond the reach of industrialization and all the problems of the day and the fast moving world of the 20th century and you know the Venetians were very aware of this and they've always played on that idea and we can see it in very clearly in the glass but there are all these parallels between American glass and Venetian glass and in my book I discuss a lot of these very things. Yeah, if you could go to that black vase that'll be the last thing I talk about but um, I just couldn't I couldn't help myself because I love it um, because this is also Mount Washington Glass Company which is Deming Jarvis's other company. We associate him with Sandwich, but he had a few glass houses. So um, the Jarvis family is again also responsible for, for objects like this. Um, and this gets back to that, the allure of Italy. Uh, and this is, this is made, you know, this um, Sicilian glass is patented in 1878. Um, so this is right around the time that Jarvis is collecting um, Salviati, and this it's is historicism, the, it's exactly what Salviati that, was doing at the same time. Exactly, and this, you know, you have the similar objects um, coming out of Italy landing at the Met, and you have places like Mount Washington um, really purposely reaching back into like the back catalog of Italian glassmaking. And they call this the Sicilian vase, so, you know, close enough. Um, and they claim that it's lava glass. And the rhetoric around this, in, if you read the patent and if you read descriptions of it, they say, this glass was made with the ash from Mount Etna. Um, it has history in it, and that's why it's dark and, and redolent, because you know, it has this Vulcan, malarkey. But, um, but you know, it's, and then they're, they're riffing off of, it, of ancient Roman glass um, that has this kind of pattern of like, picking up shards and laying into it. It's also what Salviati's looking back to. Um, Absolutely. And it's all a confection of history and of looking backwards, which again, with this Jarvis connection. And I love the fact by this time, you know, Mount Washington is no longer in the Jarvis family, but it's moved on to different owners. But a generation later, you have like the same characters it, playing out the same story. Deming Jarvis was, he was actually kicked out of Boston and Sandwich by the board of directors like Steve Jobs. And then he started a factory down the street, um, uh, which made very similar objects. And eventually he did Mount Washington. But he was a really pivotal, seminal figure in glassmaking in the United States, doing more than just utilitarian glass, more than window glass, more than offhand things. It was really art glass. And the press glass really was cutting edge technology. And it was an idea of bringing high quality glass to the masses which a lot of purists who want to see the handmade pieces weren't interested in, but this was all part of Deming, Deming Jarvis's 
genius. And he really, when he built Boston and Sandwich Glass Company starting in 1925, he was great to his workers. He was an early example of paternalistic industrialism. He built the whole town, he took care of them. And I, I, in the book, I talk about how when Jarvis saw Salviati being formed, he had to think this was similar to what he had seen when he was growing up. So there's a real crossover there. He saw the factory at work, he saw how Salviati was remaking a whole new industry. So there's a crossover there as well. In moving, all fields forward, but certainly in this case, glass. And I will very shortly get to you, Giorgio, because you're the perfect, uh, you're the perfect model for this. But um, I wanted to talk about how glass then came to be introduced to America in a, in a bigger way. And I really wanted Jim to talk about this very interesting exhibition, a traveling exhibition called Italy at Work. Oh. I know we're bouncing pretty far forward, but I just, I think maybe we should. <laughs> well, any, any, anyone who's involved in 20th century decorative arts in America knows the Italy at Work show, but it was, it was really important in the post-war world because after World War II, it, was, it ended up being backed by the American government, actually, and it was, a, it was an important exhibition of Italian decorative arts and design and a whole bunch of luminaries uh, from the world of art and design got together with the Italian government and a man named Dr. Max Ascoli, who's forgotten the history, and I, I tell his story, he's a very interesting guy. He was a, an Italian professor who was an anti-fascist, so he had to get out of Italy and he went to Sardinia, and then the Rockefellers brought him to the United States and he taught here in New York, and he started a, an organization called um, HIH, House of Italian Handicrafts, and he started this idea that after the war, Italy was destroyed after the second war and um, they were broke and there was a real possibility that communism was gonna, Soviet communism was gonna take over Italy and the American government did not want this to happen. A anyway, Italy at Work was put together by luminaries in the American world of art and design and um, it, they selected 2,500 objects and it came to the United States and the idea was to restart the Italian economy. The Marshall Plan wasn't enough. So, and the arts and crafts world of Italy was such a huge part of the economy. People figured it out, economists figured it out. And so this, this show was initiated and everyone wanted in because it was a way to rebrand Italy after the war, to erase the idea of fascism and of Mussolini and to bring it back so it was called Italy at Work, uh, uh, Italy and her renaissance, I know that was in the title, so they were evoking the renaissance, they were trying to erase the stigma of the second war and save Italy, and the US government really wanted it to remain uh, free, and they didn't want the communists in, so they put together this amazing exhibition, and the brilliant idea was that it would tour the United States. Uh, they started in 1950 here at the Brooklyn Museum, and the idea was that the objects that were on display, so it was glass, ceramics, fabrics, furniture, all of these things would be on display in museums throughout the country, and in the major department stores, they would sell the same material. So it started here, and it was tremendously successful. Something like 30 million Americans uh, were exposed to everything that was in the exhibition, including from my point of view, one of the greatest things, Italian glass. Um, there were many companies represented, but Vanini was the star of the show and kind of sold, and that's how Vanini became a household name in America. And this exhibition really influenced American culture in a very profound way, uh, but there was also a political motivation behind the whole thing. So there's the world history being influenced by glass, ipso facto. Um, anything else, Sarah, is that what you want? Oh, yes. Well, these things are all interrelated, and, and to see how the decorative arts really are involved in world history and to tell those stories, I think, is, is really important. Even today, it's the same lessons over and over again. It's the same situations over and over again with collectors, with dealers, with manufacturers, with uh, the intentions of nations. It's, it's always the same ideas, and you can really tell those stories. And I think with physical objects and material culture, it's very important that we preserve these things, that it's not all just images on a screen, that you can see physical objects, handle physical objects. And this is the genius of amassing collections. And it's also the genius of collectors who will share this with the public. And Giorgio and Nancy are doing this beautifully now at Magazzino. Um, they're showing their collection of art, of uh, Italian art, but also glass, and that's part of the connection that we'll discuss today. Pardon me. No, no.
Oh, sorry. So um, I'd actually love to turn our attention to, uh, speaking of collectors, uh, wonderful collectors, Giorgio Spagnu and Nancy Olnick, who are the co-founders of Magazzino Italian Art Museum. And they were some of the earliest collectors, certainly in the United States, of Italian glass. And they, their Italian glass collection is one of the finest in the world, not just in America. And very happily, they have always been very generous in sharing their collection with the world. And actually, that generosity led to a very important exhibition of their collection at large in 2000 at the American Craft Museum. And this was an, a very important event, and I think it was important beyond even what they had imagined. Uh, they were invited to show their collection, and they were very they were very kind to do so. And it was photographed beautifully. There's a, a marvelous catalog that accompanied the exhibition, and I think it was a surprise to them, and uh, that so many people reacted the way they did. This was enormously popular, and at the time, it was the. The first exhibition really in the United States that had shown so much glass and was really a, a marvelous overview of 20th century Murano glass. So uh, that exhibition ended up traveling throughout the world. And Georgia, I, I, I'm going to ask you to even talk about how you managed to ship all of this around the world. But first, um, I want to reiterate that there is this marvelous ex exhibition at Magazzino in Cold Spring in the new Robert Olnick Pavilion, which is devoted to the glass of Carlo Scarpa. And it is a collection of Scarpa's glass that is the largest you can see really anywhere in the world. There are, of course, marvelous pieces of Scarpa glass in various museums all over the world, but this is the largest collection, and I really encourage you to see it. Uh, so I just want to ask you, Giorgio, many questions, but first, I, I really think the origin story of your collecting is, is fascinating, and it is, as with all collectors, uh, connected with art as well. So I'd love you to address that. Thank you. Thank you for having me here. Go ahead. I think to all of you to listen to the story that I'm going to tell you, <laughs> but to go back and to make this more uh, understandable, uh, I wouldn't start from the exhibition at the Craft Museum, but I would start at how we got to the Craft Museum, ah. which is uh, the way how uh, the collection was uh, exhibited the first time. We had land uh, a very large segment of the collection to an exhibition on Carlo Scarpa that was taking place in the town of Brescia in Italy. And that was the first time that uh, a single uh, designer, Rano glass, was ever exhibited in Italy. Uh, before that, the glass was always attributed to the maker, either Venigno or, or Capellino, whoever was the manufacturer of the glass. Little place had ever been left the designers to the ones who have conceived the piece. The exhibition was very successful, and uh, at the same time, they were organizing a big uh, exhibition of Carlos Scarpa at the Canadian Center for Architecture, the CCA. The founder of that exhibition um, had seen the glass in Brescia, contacted us and said, you know, I've seen a beautiful exhibition on Carlos Scarpa, would you? willing to lend your collection to uh, the Musée des Arts Décoratives in Montreal to exhibit to the Canadian at the same time that I will be showing the architectural work of Carlos Carpa. We had no idea that uh, we could had covered an exhibition in the museum, and so happened. We called the curator of the exhibition in Croatia. Marino Barovier, and Marino put together a selection, a collection devoted to the work of Carlos Carpa. For both Capellin and Benin, where the two manufacturers produced the glass. The exhibition was incredibly successful. In uh, 28 days that it was exhibited, it was in 1997, uh, the first time that we were uh, contacted, and the exhibition took place in 1999, two years after. We had over 18,000 visitors, which was incredible. We got so many people attending the, the exhibition. Oh, uh, sorry. The director at the time of the Craft Museum saw the exhibition in Montreal and contacted my wife and partner in crime in putting all this collection together 
and ask it if we could actually lend the entire collection that we had put together, not only the work of Carlos Carpa, but all the others that uh, were present in our collection. We covered uh, about 42 artists that had worked in Murano from 1910 to 1999, which was the year where uh, we were asked to exhibit the class. And there was an incredible surprise for us that, in fact, we had a, a museum collection of glass that could be exhibited at the American Museum. And it was there that the glass was first appreciated in a wonderful book designed by Massimo Vignelli. Massimo not only designed the book, <laughs> but he also designed the installation. And something that very few people knew is that the first work of Massimo Vignelli, fresh out of college, actually Massimo was a student of Carlos Capra. Carlos Capra was uh, studying uh, architecture in Venice. And Carlos Capra was one of the teachers. So Massimo's first work was designing glass for Venin. So when we went and asked him if we could hire him to design the book and the exhibition, he was in tears of joy. He said, you know, Giorgio, this and Nancy, this was my first work. We gave him a, a, a and he would said, you know, you just put, up, put together something and show us what it can be done. He said, don't move, stay here. And literally 15 minutes later, he comes back, probably even with a little maquette uh, between us that were going to was our exhibition. Was, quite something, quite an emotion to see that what had brought me back to Italy, that is one of the reasons why we also started the collection. Uh, Nancy went back to Italy and I very big fan of As much as I was a big fan of France, started my career. So, our first, uh, our first piece of glass was actually going to pick up a catalog at one of the auction houses, not for glass, but for the contemporary art that we were collecting together. And that was a very small glass by Paolo Venini that Nancy was immediately attracted. She asked me, what do you think this is? I said, I have no idea. It must be something French. It everything, so I'm sure they made it is too. Uh, no, it turned out to be that was Vini. Venetian glass. For me, Venetian glass had always represented the small gifts that uh, my hands would buy whenever they would Venice and bring back to my mother as a gift, which of course she would hide in the deepest of the drawers uh, <laughs> because there were more often little objects that uh, were extremely decorative and not exactly pieces of art. So I had no idea that in those years in Venice, they were also produced incredible masterpieces, incredible pieces of glass that made the history. And one of the most important designers who understood the big change that we were talking about in Venice was Carlos Scarpa. I'll go back to the other photos, but this is Carlos Scarpa. The genius? Carlos Carpa, biggest uh, the genius that he did in the field of, of glass was not only designing the glass, but was convincing the glass blowers that until then had been used to work with Maurice and all sorts of decorations to enrich the glass, to actually get rid of all these, even the pedestal, even the foot, Nothing was more important but the form, the simple form that uh, these pieces represented his, his, his idea of glass. But at the same time, he also worked with the material. This is the work that was initially made at uh, Capellin. Capellin and Venini were initially partners. They worked together and they created the MFM Capellin, Venini and Co very successful 
And he was a very young man at this time. Scarpo at Capelin was a very young man. Scarpo not yet was working at Capelin when they started together, Vinny. Uh, it, uh, it is later that uh, Carlos Scarpo is asked by uh, the owner of Capelin to come and actually uh, help design the showroom Palazzo Amula, which was the place that Capelin had decided to work once he split it with uh, Venini. Venini went on his own, and Capilini went on his own. A few years later, the Capilini went out of business, and Venini, who had already understood the importance of having glass designers, glass designer Venini, until then had always been designed by artists such as in cultures like Inuzzi. So bringing back Carlos Carp and Nini was very important. Even though he had at the same time another architect, Buzzi. <laughs> Tommaso Buzzi was extremely talented too. But at the same time, Carlos Carpa was given the opportunity to work together with Paolo Vini. And the more important was allowed to go inside the glass house at the end of the day of war, where he could understand the making of the glass itself. There is Carlos that he could, with the existing material that had been designed for thousands of years, that he could now bring a new designs with the same material. But by bringing a little change, by getting an inspiration from the Pulegoso designed by Martinuzzi. The Martinuzzi, he could actually control the bubbles. By controlling the bubbles, he designed a new series called Apollicina with the little bubbles. And getting rid of all the non-essential, it really made it a, a, an extremely big change in the world of Murano. And that is what Carlos Carpa has brought Absolutely, and his influence. Modernity. Modernity. Yes. And and by using of the strong colors, but the color and the form become the more expert. Absolutely. Deeply by cultures. Yes. It was a big change. Yes, he was uh, actually uh, very much influenced by Oriental uh, designs, especially from Chinese ceramics, even though he... Scarpa passed away in uh, Japan and he had a very big love of Japan. He was never inspired by Japanese design as much as he was inspired by Chinese ceramics. But uh, he, one of the big aspects was that being able to work with the craftsmen and uh, being able to convince them that what they were making until then was magnificent, was beautiful, but it could be done in a different way, and, and, and that is the, the result. Uh, on the left side, you have the glass designed for uh, Capilin, and on the center and on the right, the glass designed for Venimi. So he designed it for both of them. He designed the glass from 1925 to more or less 1942, even officially. He worked for Venimi until 1948, but between 1942 and 1948, Venimi was not making decorative glass was making light bulbs for the, the need <laughs> of, the, of the war. And, and the fact that he worked so closely with the blowers was actually at the time something very unusual. That really hadn't been done as far as I understand before Scarpa, because there really was sort of a hierarchy at all of the furnaces. There were the workers, the blowers, who had a certain job, the designers, and then the, the company directors. But that was really the genius of Vanini uh, and of Capelline before him, just allowing Scarpa to really to work so closely with blowers to make these things happen. And their, I think their connection was something really unique in the history of Murano glass, and it set the stage for what would come and for, for designers to work more closely with blowers and to have that, uh, that connection, which really allowed these magnificent works to be created because so many of them were so difficult to make, the techniques so incredibly difficult that they had to be encouraged to try. And there are marvelous examples throughout the history of Murano glass for, of designers who were able to work with blowers and encourage them 
Uh, Thomas Stearns, I think, is one very interesting example. Uh, Thomas Stearns is a figure who came to Vanini at, uh, uh, unfortunately, just after Paolo Vanini's death, but he was able to work very closely with blowers there to make his remarkable creations, and I think Scarpa step, set the stage for this. I think Scarpa set the stage with Paolo Vanini to bring into the Petreria and workshop designers from different origins. So the first ones to arrive were obviously Italians because they, they were working already in other fields. Right. But then Venini understood that it was very important to bring uh, designers from abroad. The first one to invite widely designers to come from, especially United States with Thomas Tells, James Carpenter, and many others, was his son-in-law, yes. uh, De Santillana. De Santillana took the, the Venini once Venini passed. Paolo Venini, when Paolo Venini passed away, De Santillana had just married the daughter. Right, so he was the son-in-law of Paolo Venini. He was the son-in-law. Right, and he carried on that tradition, that idea that Venini, that Paolo Venini had, had put forth of inviting designers, but architects, painters, all uh, people from disparate fields to come and design glass. That was the genius of Paolo Venini, and Ludovico carried on that tradition. Ludovico carried on that, but he gave the opportunity to young designers such as Thomas yeah. Dell to collaborate with the glass blower because he knew how important it was mm -hmm. Carlos Carlos' experience having the designer working together with the glass blower. Right. And Thomas Dell's one of his... Um, achievement was to be able to communicate with one of the best glass blowers that Vinini had on the house. Keiko. <laughs> Keiko Hunger. Right. Keiko was extremely talented, was second only to the Bobo you was the meat of, of the blowers in the Vinini glass works, but he did not speak English. Neither Thomas Dell spoke Italian. How they were able to communicate? Her drawings, yes, the I glass. think at first, yeah. The glass. The glass Very often, Echo would used to make an object to show talent, how was able to work and what he could do. I'm sorry for the microphone. No, no, it's I know it's it's very difficult, but it's I, very I, 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 I bring too close. I know, I know, but I, I wanted to say the very good news here is that um, although right now there's an exhibition of Scarpa's glass at Magazzino, I have been I was speaking with Nancy, uh, and uh, they will be having exhibits as the years go on, on various aspects of their collection, and I know we can look forward to a lot of glass from Thomas Stern, so I'm sure that will be sometime in the future, we look forward to that. And they do, they do have some of the best pieces in, across the board, but certainly of Thomas Stern's, and his work is very, very exciting to us because it is so modern. Uh, so I know, we've, I know we've covered a lot of ground here, and Jim's book covers a lot of ground, and we're trying to keep it, keep it brief, but um, I, I wonder if you could, if you would like to say a few words about Magazzino, about your conception uh, for Magazzino, and your plans for it. <laughs> Magazzino was born with the intention of uh, showing uh, another segment, our collection, with is Arte Povera. Arte Povera is uh, probably one of the last avant-garde that... Uh, Italy gave birth to. Germano Celant was the curator that initiated the movement. Our collection has a very large uh, presence of Arte Povera, and at the beginning the idea was to, instead of putting these artworks, which very often are in large scale, in a warehouse where no one could see, I can certainly not put them in my house, uh, we decided to get a space, a warehouse, to the new magazine. Magazine means warehouse in Italian. So we would exhibit the pieces and show with our friends in the local community. Uh, Rose, Old Spring, style, which is about one hour north of New York City. The museum became immediately very uh, successful. Arte Povera was appreciated by many, and uh, here we saw the incredible experience to see Italians coming from Italy to see Arte Povera <laughs> in the United States. Mm -hmm. As Arte Povera was not 
very well exhibited in Italy and was better present in our collection museum, we started to have a, a, an incredible Italians coming to see the work. And, and you know, it, it, with the glass as well, because so much of the glass left Italy and came to America. And we, Jim and I, have run into this over the years with Italians coming to our exhibitions and being very excited to see the material. So in the case of Carlo Scarpa, I, I think this is the case as well. So much of it, it left the country and is now available, uh, you know, it's, it's on view. And I think it's wonderful to combine the glass with the art because it tells the entire story. And I think people are used to seeing these things as separate entities, but what's so marvelous at Yale, what's so marvelous uh, at Magazzino is that you can see all of these things and understand the connections between them. And I think that's really beautiful. And I also think that that's what, you know, Jim has tried to draw this map of how this all happened. And it's all about individuals. It really is in the end for all disciplines, really about scholars and dealers and collectors coming together to make these stories and to make all of this possible. And they're all essential elements. And I, I th I'm, I'm very pleased that we could all get together. I know this is a, it's a big topic and we're just trying to cover it fairly quickly, but, uh, but I think it's a really interesting discussion. And I, I did want to say if anyone has any questions, of course, we're happy to answer them.